people who are familiar with your work and some of the sort of the things that you have talked about in the past would have almost thought you'd be the last person that they would expect to see on a documentary. Mm. And I wonder if you could just tell us both, I suppose, both of you really, how sort of Stephen persuaded you to do the project and, um, and, 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 and what your sort of thought process was behind allowing the cameras into your home, so to speak, and, and, and your work. Uh, it was uh, from Stephen uh, to offer me uh, to film uh, my activities. Um, in the beginning, he wanted to uh, shoot my kind of a social activism, uh, mainly um, against n nuclear energy, because it was a time right after the uh, Fukushima nuclear plant accident. And I was very um, active uh, to speak about, speak out. And so he wanted to film that, that era, that area, yeah? So yes, uh, um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, we started in 2012, in the summer of 2012, and this was uh, just a little over a year after the, you know, the triple disaster of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear accident. And um, when I learned Mr. Sakamoto was planning to become very vocal that summer, and it was a critical summer, at least we felt at the time, you know, it felt like there was going to be substantial change in Japan. You know, there were large social you know, demonstrations against the restarting of the nuclear plants, like over 100,000 people gathered in Tokyo, and Mr. Sakamoto spoke and so forth, and I felt somebody should chronicle this. And so initially I reached out to him and uh, asked if we you know, could possibly follow him in film. And I didn't expect an answer, at least a positive one, because of course Mr. Sakamoto is a very private person and he's quite a minimalist and he's not the type of person who would show off and share his private side. You know? But um, I think at the time we all felt that it was quite a shift. Um, to me personally, I mean I live in New York but I was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan, is not the same. It's, I don't go back to the same country that I knew when I was growing up. Um, and so, you know, I think we all kind of dove into this because we felt there was something that was so important that we had to start. And gradually, it became more about how these changes and how Mr. Sakamoto's awareness um, affect his creativity and his process of, you know, creating art. So I think we slowly found our way through to um, a more kind of um, a multifaceted focus that ties everything into his creative process. And then just in terms of the very basic kind of filming at his house or wherever he may be, were there any kind of established rules, if you like, in terms of what you could and couldn't film, or was it something instinctively that you kind of had to work with? Was there any kind of parameters drawn up in that respect? I, I don't believe in rules, you know, in filmmaking, to be honest, but I think as a filmmaker and, and, and when you follow somebody, you know, like Mr. Sakamoto, I, I try to become as unobtrusive as possible. Um, but inevitably, when you bring a camera into a situation, you end up changing that situation. So, you know, we try to be, you know, as quiet as possible, as, as minimal as possible as a team. We tried to limit our crew size to the smallest possible sizes invisible, that we could have. Invisible as possible. Right, but it's not possible. <laughs> um, and, how, and how successful were they in achieving that? Um, well, mm. <laughs> 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 well, of course, I'm always shy to be shot, um, especially um, when I uh, I take my pills or after the treatment, so um, or, or you know I practice. Bach prelude with the very, you know, the stiff fingers. Um, yeah, I'm very shy. <clears throat> but um, we had um, we had a very uh, nice camera person oh, yes. uh, who is my my own son. Right. Uh, that must help. He, yeah, he's uh, he's a, he is also a filmmaker, very young filmmaker, and so he can be always our around. He can be. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I cannot resist. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, so. and yeah that, that, was, that was one of our strategies, actually. Yeah, it's, a I good, mean, it's a good strategy. <laughs> and, and it was, well, but you know, it's, we kind of dove into this process intuitively, 
and then spontaneously, and then, you know, one of the things that happened, which you saw in the film, is Mr. Sakamoto became ill. You know, it was actually just three months after we shot the stuff in Fukushima with him. Yeah. And we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if we were going to be able to continue filming. You know, we weren't, you know, I mean, it was a very serious diagnosis, of course. Yeah. And so we didn't want to add any further stress to Mr. Sakamoto. So how would you complete this film if I died at that time? <laughs> well, now, I'm so grateful that we could kind of all laugh about this, you know? I mean, and it's... it's um, but at the time, obviously, it was, I mean, it was something you could never have prepared for. No. And, and in terms of your kind of three-year cycle, that became like a five-and-a-half-year cycle. It became a it? much longer process. But there must have been a point where you thought, well, we are going to have to pull a plug on this. And, and, and from your point of view, I mean, you must have thought, well, I'm ill now, and that's my priority. But if actually, uh, in fact, uh, it was I pushed him to keep shooting. And uh, I even said to him, well, you got a very dramatic moment in your film. <laughs> yes. Ever since we premiered yeah. the film in Venice, um, you know, this has been an ongoing, like Mr. Sakamoto would always say, you, you must actually be kind of happy that I became ill. You know, it made, it made the story so much more dramatic. And I'd be like, oh, no, you know. But, but honestly, I, I didn't want to film, you know. And then. Um, it's very but, modest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very modest. <laughs> It was very difficult, and, and, but you know, I think we all, I mean, Mr. Sakamoto is a filmmaker. I mean, he, he doesn't direct films, but he scores films, obviously, and he really understands the process, and he knows cinema, you know, and one of the most intimidating things throughout the years as I was making the film is what's he going to think when he sees it, you know, because he's a real, you know, connoisseur of film. Um, but because of that, he always tended to kind of allow us to go in the right direction without being, you know, kind of, controlling of our process in any way, you know, as well. Like, he kind of always let me feel, and I'm so grateful for this, that I'm the filmmaker, I'm responsible, you know, I'm the director. Um, and so he nudged us to continue filming. And, and when we did so, we also really wanted him to become healthy and be happy. So we started to work with his son, Neo, who's an amazing filmmaker. And so a lot of the intimacy you see is actually kind of a father and son dynamic, which is kind of concealed, uh, because, you know, he wanted it that way, Neo. But and, I, and I guess, obviously, having that diagnosis during the film and the footage that you had of, um, of Fukushima and, um, and, and that kind of sense of mortality that comes through. I mean, particularly with that very sort of stark image of the piano, which has been kind of pretty sort of devastated. But, but I guess that, that kind of can't have been lost on you, the fact that that, that whole mortality process that he himself was kind of facing. Uh, yes, and then in, in that sense, I mean, the film, I feel like, you know, when you're in a situation as a filmmaker, the, the best feeling is when a film seems to somehow make itself and you're aiding in the process. And in that sense, I mean, it's terrible what happened, but it, thematically it all, you know, kind of ironically came together, you know. And I think in a sense, in the, in the movie you have, you know, what Mr. Sakamoto says, that initially the piano felt like a corpse to him. Yeah. And then later, you know, um, it, it becomes a different meaning and, and he starts to see the, that that piano is something that is in, in part being freed by nature. Um, and I, I would imagine that maybe the cancer experience has something to do with, you know, with that shift. And I think films are about change. You know, in one way or another, you could take any movie, whether it's like an animated Hollywood film or anything. I think a good movie is about change, and in that sense, there was a lot of it in our film. So. And just in terms of, sort of the actual documentary style that you chose to uh, adopt, you didn't go down that kind of chronology route of sort of telling the story with kind of with with you know talking heads or sort of following a lot of the sort of more traditional um, storylines. You, you, you've, you've chosen to tell the story. You've used some archive footage, but it's, 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 it's very much as it kind of fits into the story now, isn't it? Um, yes, that's a very interesting question. I mean, in the process of preparing for editing, we did consolidate our footage based upon chronology. And, um, you know, Mr. Sakamoto and his team was gracious with access. So we, we had full access to his personal archives, and we also collected archival material from all around the world, which had do with him. And we did assemble all that footage chronologically, but ultimately we decided, I wanted to make a movie that really reflects upon Mr. Sakamoto's thinking process, and particularly like growing up, I really loved his work, you know, from the late 80s and so forth. Like, um, you know, he would have album titles like Esperanto, or like, you know, for, geographically speaking, you know, um, or Neo Geo, I remember, you know, like geographically 
his palette was all about making music with elements from different parts of the world as if the world was flat, so to speak, you know, or at least a smaller place. And also, I think time-wise, chronology was flat, too, oftentimes in his thinking. And that's something that I wanted to mirror in our movie, that, that I, I wanted to kind of have the chronology be about his creative process and his, his awareness, which kind of crescendos and builds in different ways. So um, I think we, we brought in historical aspects as flashbacks and moments which relate to the present tense things that are happening in the movie. In a way, this, is, this film is a um, uh, film version of um, my album, I think, a uh, little bit. Uh, because um, uh, it's, it's not the chronological, it's not um, so narrative, so li it's not so linear <coughs> uh, in terms of way of uh, making film. So um, that's what exactly uh, I wanted to make music on the uh, album, I think. And this is uh, you know, the documentary of uh, um, uh, uh, grabbing the moments of my, the process of uh, making the album. So it's kind of a parallel mm -hmm. uh, pieces of um, one period of time, same, same period of time. Yes, I think so. And it's in, in a sense, it's kind of like there's this interesting synergy that happened. Like, for example, you mentioned the piano footage. But as we were assembling the materials of history, um, we also had that footage. And we knew that, that we wanted that to be central to the film. So as we were filming with Mr. Sakamoto while he was composing for Async, I actually showed him that footage. And we talked about that piano. And then after he saw the footage, he said, Stephen, actually, can you give me that footage? Because <laughs> I want to use it in the music. And, um, and we were like, OK, great. So like, we're going to give him the footage. And then a little bit later, so his son, Neo, came back with footage of him using that music, uh, the sound of the piano from that footage in a song, which is in the album. So in the editing room, we were like, oh, yes, yes. You know, because like, we knew that this would kind of come back into our movie in this way. So our, I think our processes kind of reflected off of each other, you know, in this very interesting way. I mean, one, one of the things that you talked about earlier, obviously, is, is being private and perhaps being quite shy. But when it comes to campaigning on nuclear weapons, you, you, you have a voice, a very strong voice, and, and as much so now as you did before. I mean, do you, do you feel as if, I mean, obviously, what Japan has been through recently, I mean, is, is that in a way kind of re-energized yourself in that, that kind of campaigning spirit? Um, not after, after I, I had cancer, you know, um, I try to, I try not to uh, do the, those activisms uh, as much as before. Um, but I was kind of, um, uh, <clears throat> Pressed myself not to not to speak out uh, for a long time, more than the case. Uh, mainly uh, from the beginning of 80s through the 90s. But the end of 90s, um, I couldn't shut up my mouth, <laughs> so I started speaking out. Uh, in the beginning, well, mainly um, uh, environmental issues talking about the environmental issues. But um, uh, recently, um, the country Japan is, um, well, the society is becoming very nationalistic, fascistic, or well, as all the countries in the world are going that direction, unfortunately. But so I have to speak out also in that, well, I kind of hesitate to speak about uh, the politics, but, uh, Sometimes you know, I have to. And in, and in Japan right now, it feels as if there are quite a lot of taboos now about about mm. nuclear power and people not speaking out. In, well, it seems that's strange. And the, like um, uh, radioactive pollution lasts like a, a decades and decades, maybe a century. So, uh, but it seems uh, uh, the ma majority of Japanese people uh, seem forget or decide not to speak about or even the politicians and media 
say, well, it's, it's okay, no harm, no harm. But uh, uh, just a few of uh, very um, conscious scientists tell us, well, post the data of pollution, and you know, it, it lasts. Um, I mean, it's been the same like um, well, four years, five years is almost not, nothing. You know. um, the, some radioactive sub substances uh, will re reduce like uh, in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Uh, uranium, like uh, it took at, um, 1.5 billion years, something like that. So the, pro the, the real problem is not the politicians, but the um, regular Japanese people. And, and just um, before I open up and, and see whether the audience have any questions, one of the things I think is most notable about the film or most memorable about the film is, is the cataloging of the sounds, the way that you, you, you look for sounds and you find sounds throughout the world. And I just wonder whether you just sort of just tell us a little bit about, about you know, sort of, I mean, literally, it could be literally anything. I mean, are you doing that while you're here in London or is, it, is that something you just do as a matter of course? <coughs> well, uh, well, I don't have a um, particular method or criteria, but um, uh, I'm not. Well, in a way, I'm hunting, hunting the sounds, uh, good sounds or interesting sounds. But uh, um, in many cases, uh, interesting sounds come to me. So just. Um, Walking on the streets of Barcelona, and I just happened to hear the uh, patrol car's siren, and the the siren sounds different from other countries. So I, you know, quickly, you know, uh, <laughs> start recording on my iPhone. Well, thank, thank God, thank Steve Jobs. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is very. <laughs> In old days, um, with the tape, the, the, yeah, <laughs> tape or even at that, but you, know, you start starting mach the machine takes maybe uh, four or five seconds and you start rolling the tape. But this is like uh, maybe two, two seconds, three seconds. So because um, it's like a, a fishing, you know, a hunting a sound, interesting sound is like a fishing. Uh, if you if you um, if you cannot get the right moment, you know, the sound goes away yeah. quick, very instantly. So you, know, you need a, you need a very um, fast muscles to <laughs> react. Rabbit. Yeah, Rabbit react. Rabbit yes, <laughs> yes. So yeah, you have to train your um, sense of um, you know being hunters, you know, hunters and collectors. Sound hunter. <laughs> It's a very complex subject to talk about mm -hmm. Tarkovsky and his films, of course, because th there could be so many asp aspects to talk about. But um, uh, let's let's say his his book, his book is titled un entitled um, "Sculpting in Time." So. He was very conscious about uh, constructing something in time. And the making something in time is definitely very musical. Uh, we musicians and composers always think about making or uh, designing something, putting something in time. And so um, I always gave this example in the very beginning of uh, one of his, his films, The Mirror, uh, which is not so narrative film compared to other his films. Uh, it's like a, um, the way of making this film, Mirror, is almost like um, re representing uh, his dreams, his own dreams and memories. So the uh, the story is not uh, linear, not chronological, but it jumps back and forth. Um, and so that's the film, but um, also they're talking about the introduction of the film. 
his construction with, uh, with people and uh, movements of things and landscape and the sounds all constructed, composed very musically. Like uh, we see the back of uh, Tarkovsky's own mother and then another unknown guy walking very far uh, on the green field. And then all of a sudden, the wind comes and waving the green. So all the <coughs> composition of those movements and the sounds constructed, made, made as a piece of music to me. And so the, this film, well, all of his films are made in that way to me. So I can, it's not, um, I get the inspiration from images or his imagination. Well, I do, but also I, I can learn musical composition by looking at his film to me. I like uh, almost all art forms and uh, musical forms, everything, except Hawaiian and country western. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a huge difficulty to look at the musicals too, so I, <laughs> it was not uh, uh, I uh, sought the uh, excitement of New York City, like uh, lo looking, going into musicals and jazz clubs or something like that. I. <laughs> I moved there in 1990, which was the, uh, the time New York was losing its excitement of the 80s. And um, the city lost great artists already, like uh, uh, Keith Haring and Basquiat and all other great artists. So it was a um, sort of a bad timing to move there. <laughs> The, the reason I moved there was um, people come to New York, all, all corners of the world. Uh, so I can get, well, let's say, for example, um, the Korean owner of a uh, corner grocery store is actually a great Kayagu player. Yes, and uh, maybe a um, delivery guy from West Africa is a very good guitar player, something like that. So in, in, in a very small island, uh, we get um, almost all kinds of cuisine of, uh, all over the world and music and musicians in a very tiny island. So that's the main reason I moved there. Maybe uh, the Amp Odyssey is the original since the, the YMO period. But the other, other machines, um, you know, maybe uh, I own something for 10 years or maybe five years, that one, well, yeah, something like that. So they are not uh, all from that period, but uh, some of them are, yeah. No, thank you. It's good and, to see uh, you use I, both. Yeah. yeah, I look at. I sometimes I look at um, the gear I have in my private studio, a very tiny private studio, and probably in the past two or three years, they're all analog sensors. No, no single digital keyboard anymore. I'm sorry about the uh, Yamaha people. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an evolving process for you, or, 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 or do you have plans? Or? Well, um, for well, in long time of my career, uh, I have I have been always going very zigzag way, uh, like um, a heartbeat, which uh, was made in 1991, was a heavily house. Uh, influenced <laughs> album. The next one is a um, very, very hip hop <laughs> kind of. <laughs> then 
I fed up of all that. So uh, the next one I made was a very classical piano trio, then orchestral. Then from 2001, I, because I, I, I got to know uh, Karsten Nikolai, the German um, electronica guy, so I turned into more electric side. So always zigzag. This time, uh, because of Async, my latest album, I love it so much. Actually, uh, the catch copy for Async uh, for releasing uh, is I don't want anybody to listen to this because I love it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel sometimes, sometime like uh, if you like something too much? You know, I don't want to show it to anybody. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so I, I feel that way. Well, anyway, so I like the asking, and it's very important. You know, it, it means a lot to me. So instead of going zigzag zigzag way, this time I want to develop from asking to something next. And I'm planning to make another opera. It's, it's non-opera. <laughs> it's not an opera with an arias and uh, choirs, but uh, something very weird. <laughs> uh, so I'm planning to um, premiere this non-opera in 2020. Look forward to that. Yeah. Um, sadly, uh, we're out of time. It's been a real thrill to be able to um, show the film here today. I really want to thank um, the people at 3333 and the Japan Foundation and Munro Films and Modern Films, all who have been part of making tonight possible. But of course, a huge, huge thank you to Stephen and to Ryuchi. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>